Say cheese, benches. All right, so last week on our Instagram and on Twitter, we posted our top 10 rookie rankings, both running back, wide receiver. Make sure you're following us on Instagram at Big Dogs Fantasy, as well as, you know, the Twitters, which will be linked down below. And these are for Dynasty. These were consensus between myself, Noah, at FB God and Mike at Mike Me Up Two Ps, who are handling the bunk bed breakdowns, which are dynasty specific videos that come out every Wednesday. So make sure you're checking them out if you're trying to stay up to date with your dynasty leagues and whatnot. This video today, we're gonna be talking about my top five rookie running backs for redraft for season long. Because once you get to like RB14, yeah, they're important in dynasty because you got your rookie drafts and you need to draft some players in the fourth round, right? Today we're talking about season long though. So we put this up on Instagram. I, you know, I went along enjoying my day. I logged bike in a few hours later, bunch of notifications. 62 new hearts i'm like yay people are liking the post four comments in my head i'm like ooh, perfect those comments are definitely saying something like wow these rankings are so good perfect literally nothing wrong with them i have exactly the same top 10 i've been in the fantasy football space for a little while now and literally no one has ever disagreed with something i've said before so why would any of these comments be different so i go i check the comments and i come across this one from my man italia 63 my guy straight out of the pizzeria he's been playing in pizza dough since he was like seven years old while we were all in sandboxes he was in dough boxes while we got normal blankets to sleep with my guy was wrapped up in a in a dough blanket straight out of Naples. I don't even know why I'm saying this. I'm, I'm Italian myself, so I'm not shitting on Italians. But here's what he commented. Rookie running backs never produce consistently in fantasy the rookie year unless it's a known commodity such as Zeke or Saquon. My money is on Jonathan, referring to Jonathan Taylor. That kid can jump, cut, and go 0-60 to 60 in a blink. I commented back, rookie RBs produce every year chief i hate that i threw chief in there to be honest with you he comments back not week after week like a christian mccaffrey i disagree you might get rb3 production he makes a great point though no rookies produce like christian mccaffrey because nobody fucking produces like christian mccaffrey he is one of his own kind he literally just had like the best fantasy football season of all time for a running back of course you're not going to get production out of a rookie like christian mccaffrey because you're not going to get a production out of a fucking veteran like christian mccaffrey obviously i'm not going to stand for this since i'm really fucking annoying i had to go back and check out all the big facts and i wanted to see how consistent they were or how many in terms of volume we can kind of expect to produce year over year so i whipped up this little chart for y'all what i did was i looked at the rookies over the last five years 2019 back through 2015 i listed them and i wanted to take all of the top rookies all of the rookies that have finished as an overall top 24 running back or in terms of points per game they were a top 24 running back and on the top there don't be a dick obviously it's supposed to say miles sanders josh jacobs and david mont Montgomery. Here's what the numbers tell us. We have a lot of RB1s. We have a lot of RB2s. So these are better than just RB3 production, my friend, Italia. Italia, don't be foregoing rookies because you think they're giving you RB3 production. We know historically that they're much better than that. Over the last five seasons, there have been 10 RB1s overall. So on average, you're getting two rookie running backs that finish as an RB1 in fantasy. There have been seven RB2s overall. So from RB13 to RB24, there has been seven over the last five years. So that's seven. 17 total over the last five years that are RB2 or better, meaning that on average, three to four running backs, rookie running backs will finish as an RB2 or better. Four rookies over the last five years have finished inside the top five overall running backs. So you're almost getting a top five running back per season out of the rookie class. As you can see, rookie running bikes are very important for fantasy football. This is a very strong year for rookie running bikes. So I'm expecting some big production, which is why you need to be paying attention to this episode. Y'all ready to kick things off? Tuck your shirt in, stop yelling. Let's hit the intro. All right, I'm going to kick these audio ones off with some love for the podcast peoples out there. This is a review from eBork2197. Love it. Nick knows his audience and caters to the people he wants to attract. Lots of experts. You shallow, semi-obvious pieces of information to back up their opinions. But Nick and BDGE as a whole use so many different stats and useful data to help listeners become better fantasy players. Teach a man to fish. Make a marg. As I always say, it's one of my famous sayings. You know, you could hand a man a marg and he'll get drunk. But if you teach a man how to make a marg, he stays buzzed. Anyways, you'll get a good laugh out of the podcast too. Just listen and you 
won't turn back. Thank you, E. Bork, Borch, whatever your name is. So if you want a chance to be featured as a review on next week's episode, make sure you leave a five-star rating and review on the iTunes podcast. Let's get into the rankings. Uh, Of course, this is no draft capital taking into account. This is all college production and what we know from the NFL Combine. Some of these guys have not even competed at the Combine, so we'll have to wait for their pro days to get athletic testing numbers. Now, I'm going to try to be as objective as possible. DeAndre Swift is my running back one. He has the best odds per Vegas to be the first running back off the board. I believe he's like almost minus 250 or 300, so he's a pretty heavy favorite to actually get picked before Jonathan Taylor. When I look at Jonathan Taylor, and we'll dive into him after this one, Taylor is probably a really solid bet to get 300 touches his rookie year wherever he goes, so he probably has the best mix of floor and ceiling among any of these rookie running backs, but DeAndre Swift out of Georgia is an absolute stud. He has everything every part of his game just screams elite fantasy producer at the next level when I look at rookie running backs there are a few boxes I want to be checked before I kind of write them off as like yes these guys are going to be fantasy producers despite their situation if it's a bad one that they're put into so size look at DeAndre Swift 5'8 212 pounds now that's not necessarily big right 5'8 is short 212 is a good size for running back especially the way that running backs are tailored nowadays you have Jonathan Taylor tailored like a freak right he's like adrian peterson he's basically a light-skinned adrian peterson we don't need it. most of the running backs that we see succeed nowadays are not 225 plus pounds so deandre swift 58 212 do not be deterred by his size that's still 87th percentile in terms of bmi and you look at some of the other running backs that weigh in in that 212 to 215 pound range or even lighter are pretty damn good at fantasy football you have christian mccaffrey dalvin cook alvin kamara miles sanders aaron jones austin eckler melvin gordon kareem hunt so we look at size he checks the box for that especially in terms of what what today's NFL running backs looks like. Look at speed. He ran a 4-4-8 40-yard dash, which puts him in the 80th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. That is so important. Next thing we look at is production. So I want to know that this guy is very athletic, relative to other NFL players, right? Because you could watch the film, you could watch the tape and say, oh my God, look at this guy breaking away. He plays faster on tape. He plays faster in the game or whatever. And that might be true. I don't really know the fucking science behind it. But what I know is that when you run the 40 yard dash, your long speed is relevant to every other single player who has ever run the 40 yard dash at the NFL combine. So it's telling you exactly how fast you are relative to the guys who did it in the exact same environment and the exact same experience in the exact same everything so that's why I like to use the 40 yard dash it's not really a big deal for me in terms of like comparing him from one player to another if it's like 0.03 away from somebody else but it's it, it's important because everyone is exactly in the insane same environment and had the exact same experience doing it 448 speed for someone that's 212 pounds fantastic to see so you like the size you like the speed you like the weight adjusted speed score next is production you have to show me that you're good at football if you're good at football the numbers will follow I can't this is why I've, I've been getting more and more away from the people who watch film and the people who grind the tape and want to tell me things like, oh, his vision's so good. His contact balance is so good. His, you know, his intangibles are great. And yes, that might be true. But guess what? If your intangibles are that good, it shows up in the box score. If your contact balance is so good, guess what? You're breaking tackles. Guess what? You're averaging 5.7 yards per carry instead of 4.3. If someone has bad contact balance, they're going down quickly, which means that will show up in all these other box scores. So yes, there is time and place for context for everything but for the most part numbers and analytics and production take care of the story that's being told behind the intangible kind of thing when I look at a college running back I won't put this in 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 black and white because we'll we'll learn from Josh Jacobs last year right was Josh Jacobs was definitely was a miss overall because he wasn't like my 101 in rookie drafts and I'd still probably take Miles Sanders over him in dynasty the reason I didn't like Josh Jacobs is that we never saw him carry the full workload over an entire season right he never had a year where he had 200 touches or whatever he never had a year where he went off for like 1,300, 1,500 yards. What I want to look for is that 1,500 yard from scrimmage season. And he actually never eclipsed 1,500 yards, but this previous year he had 1,434 yards. 2019, he got a shoulder injury in like week 12. And from that point on, he had like 12 cumulative carries over the next three or four games. So had he had like one normal game over the last three or four games, he would have crushed that 1,500 yards from scrimmage mark. So 1,434 is close enough. It tells me that he can play at that high of a level 
production over a consistent long period of time, that checks that box. The next thing I want to see is, yes, you can have production. You can have the 1,500 yards from scrimmage. But what happens if you're A.J. Dillon? You're getting 400 carries in order to do so. So I want to see efficiency against good defenses. 6.6 career yards per carry versus SEC defenses. That's all I need to see in terms of efficiency. When you look at elusiveness and broken tackle efficiency, shout out to the boys over at Sports Info Solutions who have advanced metrics up on their website, and they gave us access to it. So yards after contact per attempt, 3.7 yards after contact per attempt, tied for seventh in the country among 121 qualified running backs, broken tackle rate over the career, 23%. It's not elite, but that is 36th among 121 qualified running backs, still in the 71st percentile. So yards after contact, he is tough, right? These are where the analytics come in. You could say someone's tough and he grinds for the extra yards, but show me that yards after contact number and tell me that it's among the best in the nation. Top seven for DeAndre Swift, broken tackle rate, 23%. Good enough because he encapsulates what you need on all three downs. The receiving game production is the one thing that separates the guys who have a nice floor with a really good ceiling. His receiving game production, he had a 32 catch season his sophomore year, which was all I needed to see. Then he follows it up with another 24 catches this year. So DeAndre Swift, size, speed, elusiveness, receiving production, production in college. Like he checks every single box and he's going to get the draft capital. Guys, I can't hammer this home enough. Draft capital is so important because it indicates how much opportunity you're going to be given your rookie year. If you're not a day one or day two pick, which means in the rounds one, two, or three in the actual NFL draft, you're going to be facing an uphill battle. If you're a round three pick, you're even facing an uphill battle because you look at the guys who were round three picks last year. It was like Devin Singletary, David Montgomery, Alexander Madison. All of them had to compete for the starting job. Job, right Devin Singletary didn't get it until like week 10 David Montgomery didn't get it until like five or six weeks into the season he wasn't very good Alexander Madison never got it so I'm telling you as soon as you get past like rounds one and two and arguably three you can compete for the starting job but you're most likely going to be in an RBBC if you're around three pick anything after that is complete dart throw and you're being very you're not being objective I'm telling you if you're outside of the first two rounds or first two days which is the first three rounds peel back a little bit on the running backs especially for redraft so they need to be picked early and that's what DeAndre Swift is going to be. He's likely going to be the first running back off the board, probably in the first round. So first round draft capital plus his talent, man, give me DeAndre Swift all day. The way this guy cuts is, I don't even know how to explain it. It, it He stops on a, uh, literally stops on a dime. He's like, his stanky leg would make fucking Chris Brown jealous in his peak when he was really breaking shit down. The best way I could uh, describe DeAndre Swift is that if this was Madden, every one of his ratings, like elusiveness and spin and power and speed and awareness and agility would all be over 90. They'd all be probably like from that 93 to 95 range. I don't know if anything would be necessarily elite, but everything is really good and that shit adds up because you can get it done on the ground productively one way or another. If he can't do it through speed, he'll do it through his cut. If he can't do it through the cut, he'll spin around. If he can't spin around, he'll have a vision where he needs to find a different hole or some shit. He does everything really, 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 really well. He didn't do much his freshman year. That's because he was sharing a backfield with Nick Chubb and Sonia Michelle. This guy was legitimately taking away the passing down work and carries. He got almost 100 touches his fresh, his true freshman year at Georgia in the SEC while Nick Chubb and Sonia Michelle were in that fucking backfield. Both of them were top 35 NFL picks. Swift is my top rookie running back as of right now. But Jonathan Taylor is right there. I would not fault anyone for going Jonathan Taylor above DeAndre Swift. He is probably the most prolific and iconic running back of this class right now, especially after what he just did at the combine. He blew it away with a 4-3-9. 5'10", 226. He is the old school style of runner that people think about when you hear the words workhorse running back. Like I said before, he's basically a light-skinned Adrian Peterson. When you see him, you're like, holy shit. How is that guy not a linebacker? How is he a running back? And then... He fucking blows you in the face for 200 yards on the ground. Little fun fact about Jonathan Taylor. He actually originally committed to play at Rutgers. He was going to be the running back at Rutgers. He eventually decommitted and went to Wisconsin. I don't know. I just feel like anytime you hear anything about, if you're from New Jersey, anytime you hear anything about New Jersey, I guess in particular, you just have, you, you feel like a sense of pride, even though this is like an anti-pride thing because he decommitted from us. So fucking Jonathan Taylor. You could have went to Rutgers and been epic and probably would have ended up like, as like a six round pick. The story behind Jonathan Taylor is his production is just absurd. This guy was getting touches at Wisconsin like a hot girl at a club. Three years at Wisconsin, the guy went over 300 touches in all three years. 307, 315, 346. He went over 2,000 yards from scrimmage in all three seasons, averaged 18.3 touchdowns per season. When you look at his profile, like from the athletic standpoint, it is fucking absurd. What he did at the combine 
almost didn't make sense mathematically. Weighing in at 226 pounds, he ran a 4.39 40-yard dash, 99th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. He topped 150 yards from scrimmage in 20 games. In 20 of the 41 games he played in, he was over 150 yards from scrimmage, dating back to his true freshman season. He's gone over 200 yards from scrimmage in 13 games, 32%. So one out of every three games that Jonathan Taylor stepped on the field at Wisconsin, he was going over 200 yards from scrimmage. With people that don't like Taylor, or for some reason they're like dropping down the rankings, it's so nitpicky that so when I'm looking at the concerns I, one of the articles I wrote in the dynasty rookie guide that big dogs produces each year last year was the top five running backs coming into 2020 and this was prior to last season so in, in this year's guide I will write an article top five running backs in the 2021 class for Taylor my only concern was the pass catching work right because he had eight receptions his freshman year he had eight receptions his sophomore year I was like I'm gonna need to see something a little bit more to let me know that he's gonna stay on the field on third down to the next level he did that this year, 26 receptions, 252 yards, 9.7 yards per reception, five receiving touchdowns. I'm good right there. And he actually ranked 14th in the country in yards per route run per PFF's draft guide, which is fantastic. So again, I'm good there. A lot of people are concerned about the workload, which is you know not crazy because he comes out of college with almost 970 touches to his name, but the guy never, never dealt with injuries. It's not like he slowed down at the end of the year. He was still going for 200 yards from scrimmage games in weeks 11, 12, 13. So he never slowed down. The workload was never too much for him. And plus this video is more for redraft or season long. So you're not worried about what's going to happen. If you're concerned about dynasty and the number of touches he had, I can understand that. He was someone who had a billion touches in high school as well as college. So those will add up over time. But for this upcoming season, I don't see many paths in which he doesn't have at least like 280 touches because he's going to be one of the first running backs off the board. He'll probably be the first one off the board right behind DeAndre Swift. So he's going to have the draft capital. The other nitpicky thing is like he's not shifty enough he doesn't wiggle enough he's not like elusive enough I'm like grow the fuck up this guy shifted his way to 2,000 yards from scrimmage all three seasons like what are you talking about when you have that kind of combination of just like size and speed you have the luxury of, you don't even need to be that elusive because one-handed tackles are are not getting you so they almost perform as your juke move for a normal running back that would get tackled by some wimpy tacklers and when you look at the numbers yards after contact per attempt 3.7 was tied with DeAndre Swift for top seven in the country breakaway runs all that shit I mean broken tackles he was top three basically in the country in every category dude is a beast and depending on his draft capital unless something drastic happens where he drops like the bottom of the second round or like in the third round there's probably going to be good money on him being a first round pick this year in 2020 fantasy drafts all right, so we got DeAndre Swift. We got Jonathan Taylor. Now, number three, four is where it starts to get very interesting because people are going to have different takes for these guys. And as I brought up, one of the articles in the Dynasty Guide that we will be putting out this year is top five rookies to be paying attention to for the 2021 class. This is in the Big Dogs Draft Guide, which is sponsored by Monkey Knife Fight this year. We sold the kit of both the season long and the Dynasty Rookie Guide last year for $50 a piece, and y'all loved it. Thanks to Monkey Knife Fight, you're literally getting it for $10 this year. It's, it's $10. Don't drink two coffees the next two days. I would never be able to do that, but literally the best deal you're going to get on the internet. In the Rookie Dynasty Kit, we are going to be writing up in depth every single player, the prospect profile. You will get our Rookie Dynasty rankings, season-long rankings, where you should be targeting these guys in rookie drafts. And I have a list of exclusive articles you're going to get in the Rookie Dynasty Guide. The best late round targets, wide receivers in your rookie drafts, the best late round running back targets in your rookie drafts. Same thing with tight ends, quarterbacks, top five running backs of 2021, top five wide receivers of 2021, breakout wide receiver targets, breakout running back targets, super flex drafting strategy. We're also going to do a startup Bible. I was hesitant to do this because if you got the draft guide last year the redraft one I do the big dogs got to eat bible every year which is exactly how to attack your entire draft position by position your entire strategy for the draft will make your draft very easy we put all the time in on the back end so with monkey knife fight you're getting both the rookie dynasty kit and the season-long guide which has all the top sleepers the top busts the must draft players for your regular season-long guide so there's, there's just so much fucking value packed into this Go to bigdogdraftguide.com forward slash MKF. You're getting all of this for $10 plus a 100% deposit bonus on MKF. So go there, deposit 10 bucks. You will get both guides absolutely for free. Play one game on MKF and 
It will all be yours. I'll shoot you over an email when it comes through. I love you. BigDogDraftGuy.com slash MKF. Let's get to number three. It is my man Cam Akers out of Florida State. This guy is fucking awesome. He also checks all the boxes. The one glaring weakness to Cam Akers' entire production profile, efficiency in terms of yards per carry. But I will be the first to say that Cam Akers is as much Dalvin Cook or Joe Mixon or LaShawn McCoy as any of the running backs in this year's class. But he played at Florida State where their offensive line was miserable in terms of Yards before contact, they were almost dead last in the NCAA. In all of these ratings, Florida State was just so bad, which is why he averaged 4.4 yards per carry in 2018, 5 yards per carry in 2019. You like to see your college running backs come out with like, you know, 5.8 to 6.5 yards per carry because they're playing against college players when at the NFL, they're going to be playing against much faster defenders. But in terms of Cam Akers as a player, he checks all the other boxes. 5'10", 217, so he's got great size. 4'4", 740, puts him in the 89th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. He's only 20 years old right now. Cam Acres, like when you if you watch the combine at all the foot drills the agility drills I, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it his feet are so fun he's going to be so good if they put him into a good offense if he lands in a good situation there's a very real chance that Cam Akers could end up being the RB1 in rookie drafts if he goes to like Atlanta if he goes to like Kansas City or something in round three those are prime opportunities for a running back to compete for the absolute workhorse role Cam Akers is just so good man he's got size speed weight adjusted athleticism he went for over 1100 yards his freshman season he went for almost 1400 yards this year plus 18 touchdowns 30 receptions this year so he checks all the boxes except for the efficiency but again I'm, I'm telling you if you've heard nothing about Cam Akers the only thing you need to know is just how bad the Florida State offensive line really was Cam Akers looks like every bit of a stud at the next level and i'm really excited to hopefully get him at a value in fantasy drafts this year i might strictly draft rookie running backs to be honest with you running back number four should be no surprise to you that he's still on this list right now jk dobbins out of ohio state he is he could have eat just as easily been where deandre swift is but a couple red flags came up Dobbins did not participate at the combine except for the bench press for whatever reason. He wanted to wait for his pro day. Dobbins weighed in way lighter than I expected him to. 5'10", 209 pounds. So he's really teetering with that workhorse size, man. 209 pounds. Yes, we've seen running backs have success, but that doesn't scream out 25 touches a game kind of size and that's what makes me nervous for jk dobbins now his athleticism while he did not test at the combine we've had numbers historically dating back to high school dating back to some of the days at ohio state when they had different athletic performances he should be one of the most athletic running backs in this class but we didn't get to see it so we don't know that for sure for right now dobbins i would say this is the top tier right those four guys are in their tier together and how you want to mix up those rankings completely up to you and depending on draft capital and depending on team situations I think that any of these guys can really go in spots one through four. So Dobbins is definitely in that tier, but the fact that he weighed in only at 209 pounds makes me a little bit nervous. And the fact that he did not participate in any of the combine drills makes me nervous too. So we'll have to see what he comes out with as a from the pro day. But everything on film, realistically to me, he looks like a... He looks like a Josh Jacobs if you fucking slam the upgrade button. The dude is bruising. He's explosive. Production profile is absolutely there. He showed that he can handle the workload over the course of the season against real legit NCAA defenses. Coming out of high school, this is a fact from my man Ray GQ. Go follow him on Twitter. Dobbins had the single highest spark score of any offensive recruit in the entire country. So again, the athleticism is there. And in terms of like burst and breakaway speed, he might not look like someone who has it, but he had three separate 60-yard touchdown runs this year. He also had seven touchdown runs of 25 plus yards so he's got that breakaway speed he's absolutely a natural pass catcher as you could see in his production profile three straight seasons of at least 22 receptions so 71 receptions on his college career averaging over 10 yards per reception in each of the last two years so very involved in that aspect of the game very natural should flow and be a, a complete asset for him at the next level Dobbins is a guy that I really really like but it, it's almost like just picking your poison it's like who of these guys has the most red flags in a sense like they're all so good they're all great they're all top tier rookie running backs and all all four of these guys would have been the 101 last year in my opinion it's just like picking and choosing and nitpicking like who has the most weaknesses none of them have big weaknesses but I would say Dobbins based on his size and the fact that he didn't test and we don't actually know how athletic he is would be my 104 here then the tier breaks and I could see a lot of different guys going as the running back five here if you're someone who doesn't love 
analytics and you're more of a tape guy, I could see you throwing Zach Moss here. He has moved down my board considerably after running a 4.65 at the combine. We love Antonio Gibson here at Big Dogs, but Gibson, we don't really know what his position is going to be. He played some wide receiver, he played some running back. He only had 71 touches last year, albeit it went for 1,100 fucking yards from scrimmage. Memphis coaching staff, what is you doing? We love Antonio Gibson, but we don't know where he's going to go in terms of draft capital. Keyshawn Vaughn's got workhorse size and proved to be pretty athletic as well. But we have Clyde Edwards Hilaire here. I will again preface with there is a big tier break between those top four guys and then whoever you have as five. We will stick with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. He is a very interesting prospect. And again, if you want the full rankings, you want the full rookie rankings, dynasty rankings, season long rankings, and everything included in the draft guide, head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you're eligible for the monkey knife fight deal, if you're in one of the states in which you could play, then go to bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF to get both guides for literally 10 bucks. I love you. Clyde Edwards Hilaire, LSU. When Joe Burrow was asked, Asked at the combine who is the best football player he has ever played with this is who he said he said Clyde Edwards Hilaire who popped off his junior year on the most prolific college offense of all time when you're looking at his production profile you're like eh, I don't know about this did nothing his freshman year did very little his sophomore year 2019 215 carries over 1,400 rushing yards, 6.6 .6 yards per carry, got into the end zone 16 times on the ground. But the biggest thing right there on this production profile is 55 receptions. That is an unheard of number for a running back in the NCAA. And it's in a fantastic thing to see on a on someone's profile because you know that his skill set can translate to all three downs. Now, when he came in at the combine, 5'7", 207 is not necessarily the biggest of sizes. However, it is in the 89th percentile for BMI, but 5'7", 207, and then he ran that 4'6", 40-yard dash, which is the 35th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. So he's small and he's relatively slow. That burst score is nice to see, though, in the 89th percentile. He's very shifty. Most people will compare him to a Maurice Jones-Drew type. His lateral quickness is so damn good this motherfucker goes from this side of the room to that side of the room and 0.2 seconds and you cannot get him however when the athleticism isn't there in terms of speed does he break away runs is he big enough to plow over nfl defenders his size and speed is not really there so i'm a little bit nervous when it comes to clyde edwards hilaire i also don't know you don't know if he's a product of this system because again this was the most prolific college offense of all time in terms of like the outcomes for Clyde Edwards Hilaire I think NFL teams really like him so I believe he will get pretty good draft capital if not the end of round two early round three he will definitely be in the starting role conversation when he gets to the NFL what are his outcomes he could end up being like a, a pass catching back in the NFL and getting some carries right he could be I know I've heard Matt Kelly talk about as like a pumped up James White and that's not what you really want if you're going to be using a first round pick on him in rookie drafts do I think he has a ceiling yes I do I think he could be similar to like a Devonta Freeman right Devonta Freeman had those couple of years back in Atlanta like 15 16 I think it was where he popped off he had the literally the number one overall running back here for fantasy that year albeit was the year where all of the running backs pretty much died all like the top five top 10 guys pretty much passed away and Devonta Freeman's numbers normally would have been like you know RB7 or eight in fantasy do I think Clyde Edwards Hilaire has the outcome of a ceiling of RB1 seasons in his future absolutely I think it's possible do I think he has RB1 overall upside no whereas the top four guys above him I think in the right situations could absolutely exceed expectations to the point where they are the RB1 RB2 overall in fantasy on a good year so Clyde Edwards Hilaire I think the range of outcomes is a little bit too drastic for me to really want to invest you know the top five once we get past these top four running backs I am going to be looking at the CeeDee Lambs the Jerry Judys the Jalen Ragers you know those guys before I'm looking at Clyde Edwards Hilaire so if you're in a super flex league he's probably dropping to the, the latter half of it not saying I don't like this kid because I think on tape right my subjective take on his tape is that he's a very good running back he's extremely shifty he could do things on all three downs that a lot of running backs don't have in their arsenal so some NFL team if used correctly can really exploit these assets that he brings to the football field but there are some red flags for me and again it is the size 207 pounds the four six speed and we've of course we've seen players produce at that speed but usually they're a little bit bigger and they're in really good situations and then just the fact that the production didn't come until his junior year he did almost nothing until his junior year and that was while he was on the most prolific offense in college football history so could have been a, a product of the offense we don't really know we won't know until he's on an NFL team that maybe isn't as good as the LSU offense so that will wrap up today's episode I hope that gave you a quick little intro into the top five rookie running backs in fantasy football for this year again yo if you're getting ready for your dynasty drafts or your rookie drafts or whatever or even preparing for season long which won't 
come for another six months, you can get the draft guide right now for ten dollars. You get both of them. So even if you don't care about Dynasty, you're still getting the rookie write ups and all this all the cool shit that comes in the guide. So head over to bigdogdraftguide.com forward slash M K F. Ten dollars. All instructions will be on that page when you land there. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing everything fantasy. Five days a week, six days a week, seven days a week. I don't even know. I'm excited because I get the keys to the new headquarters in two days. I'm going to miss this setup, yo. I'm going to miss this setup. I really am. I feel like this was perfect, right? The perfect like feel of, of at home, like comfortable, but still a little bit professional in a sense. I don't know, man. Someone drop a comment down below what I fucked up. Who you would take at the RB5. I'm actually very curious. I hope you guys found this one informational, valuable, whatever. BigDogDraftGuide.com slash MKF. Love y'all.